Once again, good morning, everyone. At this very moment, we are, we are delighted to have Mrs. Ermela T. Dizon. Ermela T. Dizon. She is currently studying in DEMIS program in Andrews University, our seminary there. And in addition to that, she is also serving as an adjunct professor of missions at Adventist University of the Philippines and also one of the teachers in the mission courses online, online division in IS right here. So we are so delighted and blessed to have Mrs. Dizon to present to all of us the paper which is entitled Adventist Response to Secularism and Pluralism. This interesting topic will be presented at this very moment with a very joy joyful um, explanation and may we all enjoy this presentation I'd like to welcome mrs dizon the time is yours good morning everyone Okay, my topic is about Adventist response to secularism and pluralism. Secularism and pluralism, two very persuasive, pervasive, and common elements of the modern world. Two philosophies that people from the traditional parts of the world will find difficult to understand. Secularism and pluralism used to be seen only in the Western world. Today, however, both have become identified with modernity as well as postmodernity. Globalization and westernization have brought about secularism and pluralism at the very doorstep of the Adventist church. Many would even say and argue that these two are already inside the church at varying degrees. Whether they are already inside the church or at its doorstep, what we cannot deny is the present that they present challenges to the daily lives of Adventists and to the church's attempts to make its witness really relevant to the world. And in fact, secularism and pluralism make evangelism difficult, especially in urbanized areas. It is therefore important to know how to respond to them as well as how to tailor our mission and ministry Approaches to fit the secular and the pluralistic context. This paper describes the characteristics of secularism and pluralism and their effects on people's outlook in life and religion. It discusses the different ways of Adventists, how Adventists can exhibit secularism in a pluralistic world and suggest ways for the Adventist church to better respond to their challenges. So that's the end. I could just entertain your questions, <laughs> right? But um, so I was kind of adjusting because of what uh, Dr. Gayoba has already presented in Dr. Tornalejo. So I'm going to skip a lot uh, from my prepared PowerPoint and go to some aspects which has not been presented yet. So let me just go briefly to a brief the, um, description of what secularism is. Secularism is described as colonial imposition, an entire worldview that gives precedence to the material over the spiritual, a rational re principle that calls for the suppression of religious passion so that a dangerous source of intolerance and delusion can be controlled and political unity, peace, and progress secured. So this is actually secularism goes beyond modernization and technological advances. It refers to a whole range of modern secular worldview and ideologies that undergird some philosophies of history and normative ideological state projects. You can see here, I think I have done it too fast. Oh, it's not showing, sorry. Um, okay, let me just go to that specific part where many of the books would actually um, point out 
to how secularism came about. This is like his, the historical part. So, in other words, progress and modernization brings in secularis secularization. The theory of decline of religion, which norm normally called or known as secularism theory, was promoted in the 19th century by influ influential social thinkers as Auguste Comte and the Herbert Spencer and the like, Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud, who believed that religion would actually uh, gradually fade in importance and cease to be significant with the advent of industrial society. So there are many debates about this, um, but what we're try uh, trying to focus on is that the more technologically advanced a society becomes, the, le the less religious it will be. And for instance, in the West, particularly the United States, there are many um, studies that has been made, and one of these results is that um, the, the rejection of religious identity is the most substantial trend in religious identification in the United States. Okay, just to show you. You can see here that the in, the, there's an increased number, sorry, there's no, okay, the increased number of the unaffiliated, the religious affiliation, they would answer none. It may not necessarily be that they are coming from the world, other world religions, but they may also come from background of Christianity. But they are now identifying themselves as they don't have any religion. So it is increasing in number. And in the 2015 Pew research um, that they have done, they are already 16% of the world's population. Okay, so another person who actually defined secularization as a process is, this was taken from the work of Harvey Cox, which states that the process, secularization is a process in which religious faith is embedded within religious organizations, loses societal and cultural influence and relevance. Those loses are to be understood as a continuum from the absolute of religion as the sole provider of political, cultural, and societal dicta to the opposite extreme of total separation of state and religion in all matters, political, cultural, and societal in the holy secular city. So I have made this and I'm continually working on this because this is part of my dissertation, but this is how like, I am interpreting all of coming from different uh, sources and the researches. So it's like you can see this, the urbanization and globalization goes up. We are, we are on a continuum, the secular drift from the 1600s influenced by all these philosophers. And you can see here significantly the World War II has proven, uh, that was mentioned by Dr. Ternalejo, the World War II has proven that modernity and its um, ideologies are, is not working for the world. And that's why there is that final stages of uh, disenchantment and modernity has given birth or branched out into the postmodernism and now we are in 2018 so there are there different stages where us um, people of the world are continually growing in population and in migration to different countries and cities but secularism and pluralism is also growing and influencing the lives of people whether they're coming from Christian background or from the uh, world religion background. So what creates secularization? There are different factors contributing to secularization. One such factor is existential insecurity. According to one theory, the greater the insecurity, the more likely that people will be religious, but where economic, political, and social conditions have improved such that personal security improves, the religion loses its impact. So in other words, in modern history, secularism and pluralism permits education, politics, ethics, etc., and wherever modernity, progress, and globalization enter, 
secularism and pluralism follows. One of the evangelical writers, too, Rassi and Guy, uh, they said that philosophy, secularism is a philosophy, a way of living that concerns itself with the here and now. Uh, it is a consciously adopted philosophy that rejects all forms of religious faith and worship. So there are two main characteristics of secularism. It upholds the superiority of nature and its interpretation and methods are only based on science and philosophy. It relies heavily on these two and all else are suspect. Secularism encourages men to trust reason throughout and to trust nothing that reason does not establish. To examine all things, hopeful, Respect all things probably, but rely upon nothing without precaution which does not come within the range of science and experience. So why does it pose to Christianity, a threat to Christianity? The answer lies in the very nature of secularism. One author said that secularism is not an immorality, but a shift in the conception of the moral powers and moral ends. It should not be confused with indifference to the church. In lands where predominantly Roman Catholicism is there, it is the same as in the Philippines, secularism does not indeed assume the guise of anti-clericalism. But to Protestants, confusion between the neglect of God and the guise of an, um, the neglect of the church is itself a sign of the growth of the secular spirit. Its roots lies deeper in the pattern of human life. Uh, that does mere devotion to an institution. So that aside from merely external habits of behavior, secularism within the church is scarcely, scarcely to be distinguished from that without. Okay, it is also a political doctrine which main theorem is that there should be a strict separation of the state from religious institutions and the legal equality of people of different religions and beliefs. So to understand more about secularism, there are four main characteristics. The natural evolution, autonomy of men, and relativity and tempor temporality. So to go to this uh, briefly, is the uh, autonomy, uh, I mean, natural evolution. Let me go to that first. The secularists do not accept the biblical doctrine of creation. Instead, they believe in the premise of contingency, which assumes that the basic elements of the physical universe must have always existed. And our galaxy, solar system, and all of them all just develop from them. So out of the inorganic matter, I mean, acids were somehow formed and all through that. Through the process of evolution and natural selection, homo sapiens, man emerged and man took his place in the universe. This is the, the main, one of the main tenets of secularism. So the implication of the belief in contingency or the uh, naturalism is that when all came to exist by chance, everything can be discerned through research. Number three, everything can be explained naturally or scientifically. And four, there is no need to look for explanation of why to man's existence. The concept of contingency makes God irrelevant to the creation of the heavens and the earth. The second, which is autonomy of man, it, is, um, it leads to the belief that since man is the result of chance, he or she is free to, de to determine his or her de destiny. No deity governing his or her life. He or she creates the meaning of life, not some deity governing the universe. Relativity. If we, human beings were the result of chance, and if they simply create their social environment, destiny, and meaning of existence, then there is no such thing as moral absolutes. 
Morality or the absolutes about right and wrong is relative and depends on the historical, social, and cultural context. Those in each society bring into being a system of thought and values that has meaning only for those who create and live within it. And the fourth characteristic is temporality. This is the belief that life is all about the here and now. The secularist limits reality to what exists in time and space. There is no reward or punishment beyond this life. For him, there is no afterlife, no future world in which sacrificial virtue will be rewarded. So, that is the end of everything. So, what should they do? Then they should just enjoy the here and now. For a secular person, ultimately, whether he, whatever he chooses to do to, to, today is okay as long as he just does not hurt, hurt anyone. So with pluralism, it is a belief that all viewpoints are not, should be given equal consideration, but that they also have, should have equal validity. It means that many religious persuasion are tolerated and no single one of them is dominant. So these are some of the things that are within um, the thoughts within pluralism. So pluralists believe that non-Christians do not need the Christian message to find salvation. They believe that the world's religions will provide independent access to salvation. In pluralistic society where the truth claims and religious convictions co coexist, uh, it is often level that the Christian faith um, is not the only one that has universal validity. Um, converts person from other, converting person from other faiths to Christian is deemed as intolerant, vicodet, or imperialistic. So they say that world religions merely embody different perceptions and conceptions of and corresponding different responses to and the real from within the major variant ways of be being human. In short, Christianity is just one, uh, one uh, among the many religions and has you no know, unique claim as the final or authoritative truth. And according to the pluralist, Christianity is not necessarily the most advanced of religion and it is not the fulfillment of other religions. So these are some of the ongoing uh, belief within pluralism. They also argue that the Christocentric views of Christians should be abandoned for a more global-oriented um, theocentric that allows all religion to participate and as um, valid. So what are this is the thing that we should be um, worry about. After decades of being exposed to pluralistic views in education, um, politics, etc., workplace, the structure of which is based on religious tenets that less and less support for um, religious uh, interpretation of life. And as a result, more and more people have less uh, religious um, convictions and have unstable and uh, relative understanding of the truth. So this is the danger because we get exposed and exposed to it. The present-day secular man is highly affected by the relativistic pluralism of late modernists. It present, its precepts spout personal taste and personal choice to each his own, and everyone has a right to his opinion. We often hear this. And so in many ways, we have been already, you know, uh, permitted our lives have been pervaded by pluralistic concepts and ideologies. So this is what should we, we, we worry about. So privatist, privatization simply means that it is increasingly uh, considered inappropriate to discuss religion in the public. Religion is confined more and more to people's private lives and experiences. And oftentimes when you deal with the secular people, this is what you hear. They don't want to hear that from you. Even in the workplace, just Walmart, 
you cannot talk to your co-workers about religion unless they are the ones who initiated it and asked the question. And this privatization, this moving of faith into the closet is a factor that makes faith seem increasingly irrelevant to everyday life. The characteristic of secular people. It simply means that the world has been going on to the direction of secularization uh, for an extended period of time. And here are the characteristics of the secular people. Secular people are essentially ignorant of basic Christianity. Many of them are biblically illiterate because they have not read the Bible. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule always. Um, maybe some of those secularist people that you have um, talked to uh, actually do know some portions of the Bible um, in their previous experience with other Christians, but in majority, the secular people are not Bible readers. So number two, secular people are seeking life before death because of the belief of temporality of life. Number three, secular people are conscious of doubt more than guilt uh, there is no meaning to life. One does not have any moral compass. Doubt has taken the place of guilt as a common factor in the constitution of the preacher's word. So they have doubts instead of guilt. Number four, secular people believe that religion is irrelevant and impractical. So one does not necessarily reject God or religion outright, but believes that it does not work and does not affect the here and now, and he lives as if there is no personal God. Number five, secular people have a negative image of the church. They are not, by and large, they are not necessarily irreligious or um, immoral, but they doubt the intelligence, relevance, and credibility of the church in these advocates. Dr. Gayobas mentioned about that they have encountered so many people who are claiming to be Christians but are not living or have do not have a changed life or do not live a life differently from others who are non-Christians. So what is the difference anyway? Number six, secular people have multiple alienations. This is something that I found to be fascinating because it is true. And Lina, you were asking me about issues about mental and emotional uh, problems of people. This is where it falls to. Alienations. Their existence can be described in terms of multiple alienation from nature, from neighbors, right? They do not know their neighbor, neighbors in Metro Manila. They do not know who, is, who are the people living um, adjacent to them. Alienation from their vocations, those kinds of alienations. So, so question, how, is, how does a Christian become secular? Well, one author gave very direct answers to this. Number one is by losing the practice of private prayer. Number two, losing meaningful personal study of the Word of God. Number three is losing standards of behavior. In many cases, this is the only fact that anyone notices, right? If someone is struggling in the inward spiritual life, you see it in the outward. Due to the fact that religion is private as well as public, others do not see what goes on inside the home or the thoughts or feelings of a person. So spiritual distress sends up its first public signal when a person, personal standards begin to slip. Number four, a decreasing attendance in church. As part of the process of secular drift, slippage in church attendance becomes a very public indication that the earlier steps in the process have become quiet advanced. So missing church attendance creeps slowly. At first, you only notice the person missing once a month, then twice a month, then every week, and finally, they don't even bother coming down. Number five is doubting and apathy, which is always the uh, after results of all this number four. So. When they no longer read the Bible, they become doubtful of the many things that they first loved and believed in. And number six, distrusting of church leaders and religious 
institutions. So now that I have already a notice that I have to end now, I have to rush to the next um, slides, which is how should Adventists respond to secularism and pluralism? So I have listed here only seven, and we can all read it from the slide, right? So of all this, the number one, I think, we need to understand people. And when we, when we do understand people, that's the only time that we can truly respond to their needs. And then number two, which is very basic for us, develop a vibrant spirituality. Of all the things that are in our lives as Christians, this is something that people sense. Whether you are genuine or not, people sense it. Your spirituality, you cannot hide it. It's like a beacon. It's like a light that you know, shines in a dark, dark world. If there are too many people who are claiming that they have little lights, and so secular people wouldn't even bother to look. But if there's so much darkness, you can see little lights. And also, preach a Christ-centered message. This is very important. Many times, we are always well known, especially people from the academe are known to spout knowledge. Those are important too. But what people are really, really looking for is something that you have experienced in Christ. That was, I think, the last lesson for Sabbath school last week. So people, disciples were witnesses for Christ. What are we witnessing to and for? Right? So in the end, we need to contextualize our message for the secularized people. We need to understand where they're coming from and fit in how they can understand better the gospel. Thank you, Mrs. Dizen, for the presentation. And we'll have a short session of questions and answers before we will take a little break for the next presentations. Do we have questions from the audience? You may raise your hand. No questions? Okay, Pastor. Thank you very much for the uh, lecture uh, in line with the how Adventists uh, uh, face uh, secularism and pluralism. For, for example, I am a, an Adventist. And uh, one of the things there is uh, to minister to the felt need. And I'll go to the rally for the cause of the poor and the oppressed or the marginalized or even against the government when the government is not responsive to the uh, claim or needs of the citizens, the people. Am I a secular Adventist or am I excluded as Adventist? We cannot avoid becoming a secularized Christian. But the difference with a secularized person who does not believe in God is there's no God in his life. But a person who is like a secularized Christian is he brings his God wherever he is. Whether it is in the workplace or whether it is just, you know, talking to friends or being involved in the community. He is a person who brings God with him. So that's the thing that I can answer. Actually, in a um, pluralistic and secularistic um, world, uh, people are looking at the church, how genuine is our involvement in the community and in the concerns of the world, ecology and all those um, about uh, nature. So how are we responding and how real are we? What's the intention? So... 
And so when we go to some rallies and advocacies, this is a positive indication to them that we are concerned about the world and we are concerned about people. So it's an affirmation for them. All right. One more question, the last one, maybe, before we take a break. Pastor Dr. Tonale. I would like to comment uh, on the uh, uh, question made by my colleague, uh, Reverend Antonio, in regards, because this is a relevant question in the context of social gospel. Uh, I think uh, the question is, we, uh, uh, it's a hypothetical question from his perspective. If he is a Seventh-day Adventist, now, may, uh, let me make it a little more realistic. Could you consider me as a secular person if I join political rallies in favor with religious ends, particularly social gospel, for the need of the poor, for the betterment of society? Would you consider me as a secular pastor or a secular person if I join these political rallies for the benefit of the poor and the marginalized? Okay. If you want to be strict with the definition of the word secularism, then we don't fit that description. That's why they say that the secular drift, there is a continuum. There is a development where every person is affected by secularism and globalization, and yet it cannot be fully defined as one. It depends on the experience, and the environment where the person is. And to some extent, we are affected by secularism. And in, some, in many ways, like the, our views as people who are in the academy, we are, we are constantly exposed to many, many books that are coming actually from philosophical worldview of secularism. And sometimes we do not notice that in some ways have already affected us the way we dress, the way we think, our philosophy, like sometimes we just spout an answer to our uh, to people. We say, "Well, that's my choice. It's your choice." So we just separate our ways. That's we are already affected to some extent. So that's why I, I'm saying that if we need to be strict with the definition, then we cannot truly really say that we are in many different countries would have different stages of secularization. This is what I'm studying about right now. This will be part of my uh, dissertation. Okay. So I think you don't have questions anymore. Thank you so much. Uh, All right. Thank you so much once again. Um, at this very moment, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a short break before we start at 10.40.